To humans, wake up, wise up, do what you can individually and together. Hi, everyone, Hannah here. The modern dating world is a tricky thing to navigate. We all have expectations and desires, but what happens when you add environmentalism into the mix? For today's episode, we join together four singles who are environmentalists by trade or by passion to discuss how their belief systems affect their romantic lives. Enjoy. We are a a group of environmentalist daters so thank you to all of you for joining the panel (laughs) um i don't know if we so we are the environmentalists who date or or have experience of dating rather than trying to date environmentalists or they that could be something that is brought up during this conversation today so should we just go round and start by kind of introducing ourselves before we delve into this minefield of a topic Sure. Um, but I think you, I think you have to go first because you just defined us all as environmental daters and I need you to go first now. <laughs> of course. So I'm Hannah, I'm 32 and I'm an environmental scientist and digital nomad. I have been single for three years, which have actually been the best and most formative years of my life so far. So currently slightly hesitant to date, but maybe open to two dates if the correct environmentalist appeared <laughs> <laughs> or someone who was willing and open to discover that side of their personality if they hadn't explored it just yet. But as somebody that travels around the world, it makes my dating life a little complicated. So yeah, does someone else want to go? I'll go if no one else is jumping at a chance. So I'm Sean, I'm 33. I've been single for a It's about six months or so, although that was just quite a short-term relationship. So the last, I guess, like proper relationship I had was two or three years ago, about three years ago. So yeah, I'm not an environmentalist by trade, as it were. I don't, unfortunately, I don't do that as a job, although I would love to. But yeah, just at heart, really, I guess, more than anything else. So looking forward to discussing with everybody what their experiences are and kind of expectations of people and stuff like that. I think it's just an interesting topic isn't it just to yeah see where everyone's head is at with it with it all i guess i'll go next my name is xander i'm currently living in los angeles but i'm from new york i'm a film producer director and environmental filmmaker but i'm also a serial dater i'm 28 years old (laughs) and i have some dating stories that i find funny and my friends do too sometimes and i'm currently Seeing someone, and I would love to define in this conversation, what is dating? Mm. How do we define it? And, and yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to blend my career, my travel, my desire to help animals in nature with also having a family potentially. My name is Serena. I am the senior producer on this podcast. And I live in Northern California now, but I'm from SoCal. I would also define myself as kind of a serial dater and also like a, like a pretty jaded dater, I guess, right now. I'm also an environmental documentary filmmaker and a wildlife specialist working with large carnivores. And the location where I live is really hard because it's a lot of sort of transient people that kind of come into this town and I've moved around a lot for work too. So haven't really, this is the longest that I've lived um, in an area for work. So it's been really interesting trying to figure out if I want to like put roots down or if I want to uproot and go somewhere else. Thanks for introducing yourself, everybody. When I was planning this episode, and it's something that I actually shared with Serena, 
I saw an article in an online blog, which was about how OkCupid had found that varying opinions on climate change was the biggest deal breaker for their dating app users. And it's something that I absolutely couldn't help but agree with within my own dating experience. They'd actually surveyed 250,000 of their users worldwide over the course of a year and found that actually 90% of daters said that their match had to care about climate change. And as an environmental scientist, this is actually amongst some of the best environmental news I've heard in recent times, (laughs) that people do actually prioritise that quite so much. I was not expecting it at all. So other notable deal breakers within that study included (laughs) subjects like gender equality and gun control, which I can completely understand. Um, But today we'll just focus on environmentalism and its, yeah, close relatives. So I've wondered, did, is anyone else really shocked by that statistic of 90%? Because I definitely would have estimated that it would have been at around maybe 20% or less. I don't think yeah. I'm shocked, but I do think that there, there's like the spectrum, right? Of like, you believe in climate change, but then you don't really do anything else to kind of stave it off or, you know, do anything in your own you know, overall life. So I think it's kind of this broad umbrella term. And then within that, there are people that fall on different sides or, you know, on the spectrum of that. So I I guess I'm not that surprised. I feel like most people, most reasonable people believe in climate change, but are, you know, most are kind of unwilling to actively engage with it on a daily basis. I'd love to know how this conversation comes up when someone's dating, like, Hey, what do you think about climate change? I feel like <laughs> I feel like I'm always under like I make the assumption that they agree with me until proven otherwise. Yeah. I don't know if, if everyone does that, but I just assume that the people that I might be on a date with or that I'm dating yeah. um, probably are climate supporters in terms of climate change. It's very rare that I've met a climate change denialist, I guess. Like true yeah, it's, it's true it's, it, i think people don't like it's not that pe- too many people are kind of like let's burn the forests and or, or, unless they're making the money from it and they're the corporations in terms of most normal people if you will most people if they're asked about it probably would say they do care about it but it's just whether they're informed about it or whether they make it i don't know more of a priority in their life to to follow that i guess yeah, it's, I guess defining what an environmentalist is is, mm-hmm. is quite a, a conversation in itself. Yeah, but I, I feel like I'm definitely drawn to the profiles that say explicitly, you know, somewhere in their bio, like that they care about the environment or that they, you know, something something along those lines. Because I, I think I have that explicitly in mind that I'm, you know, I care about intersectional <laughs> environmentalism and social justice. And so like when I do find people that have that explicitly written in their bio, I'm like immediately drawn towards them. And and then the other instances, I think it's just sort of like more coded. You kind of like the summary of their profile. You're like, they probably believe in climate change. So or not, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting what you said about being really explicit about it, because I'm really I'm very explicit about it. And I'm really explicit about my interests as well. So there's, I specifically don't have any photographs of me on the dating app that I use that I have any makeup on. I'm always outdoors. So I'm like on top of a mountain or something like that. And then in, I think one of the questions that it asks is that I'm weirdly attracted to, and my answer is men who recycle. (laughs) Cause I think just having that as like a basic starting point And it also, it's kind of, I don't know, I was like, oh, it's kind of funny. And someone might see that and think, okay, so she likes men who recycle. So maybe she's really into the environment. So maybe I'll contact her because I am also an environmentalist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, right. That's the, (laughs) that's what I hope happens. (laughs) But I think a lot of guys would read that too and be like, ugh. Like, oh, she's not, not, not just that she's like an outdoorsy person, but ugh, like I'm going to have, like, if they don't recycle already, I could see that being sort of like a, like a, an annoying thing for some people that don't engage with that. They're like, oh, she's going to lecture me about, you know, plastics and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I, I think a lot of people would see that and be like, no, 
that's too much work or that's too challenging. Yeah, it's quite, or... um, I, I think that's quite, it's one of those things where you kind of, you're doing that deliberately to try and, I don't know, filter through the people that you don't really want to talk to anyway. Mm-hmm. So it's yep. kind of a de- deliberate, you know, unless, unless you're getting down with this joke, I'm not really interested. I wish yeah. I, I really wish that I spoke to you guys before many of my dates, because on the dating apps, I typically don't mention my love for nature. I'm not sure why I don't, but it's just like I don't make it a, a point. And so there's way too many dates that I've been on where they think some, you know, I'll either be working in Hollywood and out in Los Angeles as, as a film producer or in New York. So they're, they maybe that's what they think more. I'm going to be like an just like an entertainment focused filmmaker and I'll be sitting with them at dinner and all of a sudden like the nerdiness comes out I'll start spewing these animal facts or I I get on a roll about some nature film that I watched and I talk for maybe a couple minutes and then the reaction of like cool and nothing to say and I'm like well this isn't going well yeah (laughs) Um, so I think moving forward I hope you know all the listeners out there definitely be more transparent because you don't want to be sitting at dinner and realize quickly that some transparency would help. Yeah. And it's, I think it's good for us. Like it's good not to like let the other person know so that they're warned about how crazy we are about the environment. But like, like you were saying, Sean, just like a good filter for us to see who we're even interested in, like spending time with and, you know, cause like dates are a lot of work and you know, it's, it's, it is very time consuming. And especially if you've got like a bad date or like bad date after bad date, it's like really disheartening. And so I think to kind of better filter that for ourselves on our end ahead of time, like just, just somebody that is even just like, yeah, having it explicitly on your profile. And then they know that that's what they're getting into, I guess. I think something that I think is really important for me personally, though, is there's a limit to how much of that you want on your profile. So you wouldn't want like me planting a tree with the recycling comment with me cleaning plastic off a beach. And then I don't know, like, obviously that's my day to day. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So that's kind of an accurate representation of what my life involves, but I do have other passions Mm -hmm. and I wouldn't want, like I have seen profiles where that person is like, what's his name? Um, Captain, what's his name? Captain Planet. Captain, Captain Planet. Yeah, Captain, Captain Planet. <laughs> and you're just a bit like, oh my god, he's going to be too environmentally friendly for me. Yeah, because it can be t- intimidating for sure, mm. especially if you're like. Uh, I, I meet people that are environmentalists and they tell me all the things they do. They're zero plastic, you know, and I'm just like, ooh that doesn't make me feel good because I'm, I'm like, not like, I'm definitely like subpar to their, you know, what they're doing. And I think it would be challenging for me to be with somebody like that. I think it would be really interesting because it would push me, but yeah, I think it would definitely be intimidating for me to like date someone who's just like full on, you know, that's their whole personality is that. And I, I kind of do feel like our personalities are kind of driven by this but not so much to the extent like we don't have other hobbies and we don't you know what I mean I think we all have a lot of other things going on so I think we're like pretty well-rounded individuals cool a a friend once gave me great advice and I'm trying to implement it more and more in that like dating is a race to let the other person know who you are and so if you start like putting kind of who you are on your profile it's like setting that up for like let's not waste time. Cause it's like you said, like dating can be really expensive. Dating is time consuming. Ironically, dating as an environmental, as an environmentalist can take you away from the work that you need to be doing as an environmentalist. So Mm -hmm. I want to ask the group, if someone is not an environmentalist or does not care at all about nature, is that a complete deal breaker? If you still like other qualities that they have? I feel like a few answers went past my head as you were talking I like my first I was kind of like yeah definitely I ever can't go for a walk and with them and they you know really appreciate their surroundings and kind of get lost in it and you know I'm like you know if I I see like a bird of prey or any kind of bird I'm like oh look at that bird of prey and I get really excited you know and if they're like oh yeah it's just kind of oh okay it's a bit of a killjoy in it so yeah I mean it's, it's to be absolutist about it I mean if they had loads of other things you had in common with them then the reality might be a little bit different that you, or actually maybe, maybe they can learn to enjoy 
I think you always kind of have that in relationships, don't you? Where you kind of think uh, they might not be perfect, but maybe you know we we can kind of take on a couple of different aspects of our personalities and da da da. da. But yeah, for me, no, it is, it is a big it is a big kind of red cross if they're not into nature for me. Yeah, I think so too. I I I think I just sort of assume that we don't really have a lot in common because it is such a big part of my life. I think I would be open to somebody who was open to learning more and engaging more. And maybe they grew up in a city and didn't really, you know, in their youth spend time engaging with nature and, and maybe have an interest in in doing that now as an adult. Like I would definitely not, you know, knock somebody for for not having the opportunity, but there are definitely people that just truly have no interest. And I find them uninteresting because I'm like, how can you, how can you not in, in my mind? So for me, it's, it's like, are you open or are you closed off to it? And if you're closed off to it, then I just really have no interest, I guess. I am really, I just go outside every single day and it's more that aspect of my life that if I'm going to share my life with someone, that's a part of my enjoyment that I want to share with them. And someone who is like, oh, I can't do that because I'm going to get dirty or something like that as a as a base level. That's an absolute no for me, for starters. But then I am so passionate about what I do. And I'm not asking that other person to be, as you've just mentioned, the most environmentally friendly person in the entire world. But if I'm going to be speaking about the thing that I'm most passionate about in the world and that person is completely not interested and won't even give it a chance, then that would not be, I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. And they would need to be open to things like recycling (laughs) (laughs) or fixing, like fixing things that are broken or just just things like that they don't have to be this perfect person because I'm not a perfect environmentalist and I don't think that anybody is and I think celebrating your imperfections as a or not celebrating your imperfections as an environmentalist but recognizing them and mm-hmm. thinking about how you could potentially do better next time is just a very human way of looking at things so I don't know I'm not I, I, yeah I'm not expecting perfection but at the same time just being open-minded would be something that I would require for sure yeah and like there's a difference between like somebody having a very obsessive interest in something like like uh like coin collecting like i'm not interested in coin collecting you can be excited about it and i'll i'll like print like like yeah cool 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 yeah but but there's a difference between like having a hobby and then having something that's so fundamental to your life and something so fundamental to like what you think about all the time, something that's tied to morality and society. And, you know, so there's, there's not a lot of wiggle room on key issues like that for me. So I I think there's a difference between just not being interested in, in somebody's like something that they're really interested hobby wise or, you know, professionally or whatever, but it's such a core pillar of what makes us us and and it's just so fundamental to everything that's going on it has to it has to be there I guess I think to me it it links to compassion as well and compassion is something that I find really really attractive in a person and whether it's compassion towards animals towards the environment towards nature even if there was somebody who was really compassionate towards other human beings but didn't really know anything about environmentalism, I would still find that a really, really attractive quality in a person. But I think the kind of compassion that I have and the one that I find most easy to relate to in another person is compassion for wildlife and the environment. It's interesting, Hannah, that you bring up like caring for people as well. Because I was definitely, when I first started dating, you know, when I'm talking about like in college or right after college, like it was very much like I really wanted to find someone who strictly liked wildlife and nature. And that's, that was their cause. But as I've developed a more comprehensive understanding of environmentalism, which is intersectional, I now kind of am more attracted to people that are working with communities or that care about people. And I almost see that as like, okay, that's a part of environmentalism. So actually the, the last few people that I've dated include a social worker and a therapist, not environmental, but I still am very attracted to them. And I think it's because of that 
intersection that I see environmentalism that is broader than just wildlife and, and animals. Mm -hmm. It includes like, you know, developing communities or the lower income communities that are going to be most affected by climate change and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it just, I guess I, I segue into that as well, because Sean, you had brought up what is an environmentalist and it's like definitely different now than it was eight years ago when I started dating. So it's a, a transition of, of even kind of how I see myself as, as an environmentalist. And I think there's something to be said about like one of the last guys I dated was a herpetologist um, and they study reptiles and something to be said about when you throw two people together that are almost in two similar um, fields. Like, I think there's actually a lot of conflict that could happen. So dating a social worker or a therapist, there's like peripheral ideologies that you guys can both connect on, but you're not kind of stepping on each other's toes. Like this guy liked to do a lot of one-upmanship when we were talking. So, you know, I would say like, oh, have you heard about this thing? And he'd be like, you know, I've heard about this and this. And, you know, he just really wanted to flex his intelligence a lot because we were both kind of in that same sphere. So I think there is something to be said about kind of like trying to find somebody who's not like not exactly doing what you're doing, but maybe like on the fringes or similar but different kind of paths because there can, at least in my experience, dating men, men can be really intimidated by intelligent women or intimidated by, and I'm, I'm doing broad strokes here, obviously, but yeah, intim intimidated by women that are kind of like up on current events and have, have things to say and have like a response to what they're saying, you know, so that can, I guess, can be seen as combative or um, some, some tension, but that was just my one little example. Men suck. Yeah. I'll agree men, with you on men that. Men suck. <laughs> I, I'm glad we all agree. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's, it's interesting. It does tie into kind of, I don't know, your, your mentality about the world, doesn't it generally? That's kind of what you're seeking for in a potential life partner really is somebody that's going to see the world in through similar eyes to you. So whether it's directly in the field of environmentalism or whether it's you maybe expect if they, I think if you're expecting that they're going to kind of agree with you on that, then you think maybe their politics are going to be in line with yours and their worldview in general. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a segue into, into their mind at large, isn't it? And, and whether, you know, you're going to be compatible in a lot of different areas. I guess that's why we kind of look for the similarities between ourselves in those kind of, in, in maybe one way or two ways, because you hope it's going to relate to a lot of different subjects that can then, you can learn from each other, which is a really good point um, that was just made about in terms of if maybe you're dating a therapist, that you're going to, you, you know, learn things about your different different existences and different roles within society and you can kind of both grow in different ways as people but by learning about each of these traits and each of his lives i guess yeah i think that's an important point and it's funny because my understanding of dating when i like learned as a kid was like all these rom-coms i really am a sucker for rom-coms so i'm like looking for this like unrealistic love that i'm that i'm still seeking but there is something about like i don't want to find someone that just keeps me the same i really want them like I want to help them get better and I want them to help me get better. And we push ourselves to, to improve. So, you know, maybe if everyone, like, if you guys are exactly the same person, like there's not that room to mm -hmm. that wiggle room to like, Oh, I could see things differently here. or I could see di things differently here. Or like, Oh, that's cool. What you do. I'm with, like inspired. And like, I don't know, it's a little cliche, but the five people you're around is who you become. And that the significant other is such an important part of that. It's like the number one. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope that I can find someone that like, not only keeps me the way I am, but actually helps propel me into new ways of thinking, growth. Yeah, good point. Absolutely. I think what's interesting is that we've gone from talking about being way too similar. And I have to agree with you, with you, Serena, on that, that I find being around other wildlife biologists in a really intense way sometimes a bit much like you there is especially within a scientific field that there is one-upmanship and it's just typical scientists <laughs> not that I'm like going to be horrible about the entire scientific community or anything because I think you're all awesome and you're probably listening to this thinking what she's talking about <laughs> but there is obviously an air of one-upmanship that does happen and I'm sure everyone can also relate to that but there's also well, that's that the being... same with like the film industry like yeah. Xander I'm sure 
you can empathize with that. It's like, you have to be kind of like, there's a certain level of skill that's required for a lot of these fil- fields. And like, if you were dating uh, like a filmmaker, I, I don't know. Like, I think it could either be like a great collaboration where you're like sharing art and maybe like working together, or it could just completely implode because you're like, you know, you know, your cinematography sucks. And like, why do you, you know what I mean? Like, why do you think he's an awesome director? He's a misogynist or, you know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. uh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Hannah. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's completely, completely right. So we'll, we won't take it out on the scientists. <laughs> Yeah, we distribute more, it yeah. amongst society <laughs> in a in a fair way but there's also that being way too different which we kind of touched on before so something that as a vegan I can't deal with when I'm scrolling through dating apps and it's something that was very very prevalent in Australia and New Zealand less so I found in other parts of the world is men holding dead stuff is just not my vibe at all. So just an instant no from me. And the thing is, I I, I try to understand my own psychology when I'm saying no and think before I act, why? (laughs) What is it about this person? And obviously sometimes you just don't fancy them. But a lot of the time in Australia and New Zealand, they're holding dead animals. They might be a subsistence hunter, in which case, you know what, if you're going out and you're hunting invasive deer, you're helping me do my job, then okay, I can get down with that. But I don't want you taking photos of it and sharing it on social media. Like if you're going to go and do that, go and do that, pat yourself on the back and be proud of it. Go and eat your venison sausages, whatever. I don't want one and I don't want to see the photo of it. You go and do that and that's fine, but... Are there any kind of environmental or things that you see on dating profiles that are an absolute deal breaker for you? Like the second mm-hmm. you see it, you're in a, you're no. Mm-hmm. Well, and I have to jump in there because I've talked to many friends that are, that are women that consistently say, and as a, as a man, I speak to all men who are listening, do not post pictures of you holding fish on your Tinder or Hinge profile. Fish no is one the wants worst. to see the size of your fish. It's not a good yeah. look. I've heard it so many times yeah. as a complaint and it just has to be set out there. Especially yeah. if it's a shark. So, yeah. Okay, shark yeah. is an immediate. Uh, yeah, rock exactly. Swing. But yeah. There was a there was a girl on TikTok that I saw. She posted this a while ago, but she she did a screen record of like all these different dating profiles of guys holding fish and she rated their fish. So she'd be like, "I hate your fish. It is so ugly and slimy." Or she'd be like, "That is an okay fish. I wish it wasn't bleeding from the mouth, but, you know." And then, you know, she'd be like, "That's not a fish. That is a shark." Like, "I, I hate that." You know, so it was just really funny yeah I I don't I don't want to see your fish I but I also don't have a problem with people that fish because I'm I am trying to get into fishing actually and I've come around on sort of yeah subsistence living and if you're hunting your own food like I'm, I'm definitely pro doing that but again Hannah like you said like there's a difference between people that that do that quietly as their own sort of way that they live life and then the people that post about it like with a giant hog's head or like you know like I've seen some really crazy shit on dating apps like gory bloody I just I don't know what the goal is with that like are you just trying to show potential mates that you can that you can kill something like I don't why are you smiling with it like I don't know anytime if, if I killed something it would be a very somber reflective existential moment where I'd be sort of like really thanking this animal for its life and for like allowing me to to use it in this way it wouldn't be like the celebratory I don't know that's just not me and so I have a hard time feeling like I would vibe with somebody who thinks that that would be a good way to express themselves I guess and can I just add that what's even worse than them holding the, the fish and sometimes women partake in it too. And I've seen it on, on dating oh, yeah. profiles is the pretending to kiss the fish that, yeah. that like enrages me sort of like yeah. there's the, it, there's levels to this fish taking game. And also Serena, to your point, we're not living in the like cave times anymore. No, no there are so many there. other, yeah. Other traits that I will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to know that you can forage for fish. I don't know. I, I'm good. I'm good. And I have to, Hannah, when you were talking about veganism, when I was in college, I became like an animal rights activist. It was something I really cared about very, very much. So I wouldn't eat meat. Um, and on dates, like it would, I would like, they would, 
say like, oh, does, do, does it bother you that I'm eating meat? And I'd say no. And it was kind of like, I was like letting, like I was trying to minimize how much I cared, which was a problem. But there was one time that I had this hat. I still have it. I love the hat. It says, uh, fuck fur. And I went on a date and the girl ended up wearing a fur jacket when I had worn that hat. And so that was a really nice conversation. I'm sure it went so well. I'm sure, I'm sure it went so <laughs> well. Made in guys, yeah, you guys dated for a really long time. Could have been my wife, dream girl, didn't end up, but that was a funny, uh, funny little moment. Hannah, are, is, is veganism a deal breaker for you? Or I guess non-veganism? No, it isn't. And it's kind of speaking to what Sandra just said about sitting with someone while they eat meat I think if I sit opposite someone and they're eating a chicken drumstick or a rack of ribs it makes me actively just want to be sick like it really really grosses me out the kind of Neanderthalism of the of that and when people are picking fish bones out of their mouth and especially if they're kind of going in their throat and so, like it really really <laughs> just grosses me out because I haven't really ever eaten meat in my like there's been there was a point in time where I was like going through a bit of a random carnival phase but I got really sick because of that so I had to kind of stop that immediately because it was just how not how my body developed but I think with with dating as a vegan it isn't something that I lead with it's not something that's on my profile because I think you get judged really really easily and someone's decision to eat meat isn't something that I judge them on Mm. at all so I don't really want to be judged by being vegan and I think it's not uh, the thing is, I, I love cooking. So if I were to live with somebody, I would kind of insist <laughs> on cooking because I find it very meditative. Um, I find it really healing um, the way that I eat and, and I'm super into nutrition. So I would really want to be the, the kind of cook I would maybe share depending on how good they were. But if I, I don't think I could be with someone who was one of these people who is on a really strict carnivore diet, who's, especially somebody who kind of has this mind frame that because you're a man, you need meat Mm. or any of those really controversial meat eater thing, like decisions and things that people spout about. I just couldn't, I couldn't be with a person. I don't think I could love them if they had those opinions. And I think there's there's levels of being an omnivore. <laughs> um, and I think the people that are in that, there's, yeah, there's a, there's a spectrum. And I think there's a certain level of the spectrum that I could abide. And if they were like, oh, I don't eat any vegan food, like I hate vegans, obviously, then I couldn't be with them. <laughs> um, but if they were like, I like to eat a little bit of meat, I responsibly source it, or I go out and hunt it myself and I don't put my photos on Facebook then yeah, I think we could be fine. <laughs> but I guess like pr- practically, so say you say you meet a nice man who is sort of omnivorous and has like a healthy balance about meat and just say it's like the, the this, this person exists. So you go out to dinner and they ate meat and you are vegan. And then you have to like kiss this person who just ate meat. See, that's what I mean. It's like, I feel like practically for you, it's maybe more than just sort of ideological because you have to like (laughs) be close to this person. They cut, you know, and they just interacted with meat in this way. Oh, with their greasy burger hands. Yeah. It's like trying to kiss someone who just had garlic, you know, it's the equivalent. Oh, bring on the garlic. garlic. Or a non-smoker with a smoker or something. Yeah, uh, I think yeah. it's I, I think it's kind of a big deal, actually. Mm-hmm. Like, I think you could make it work. Like, if you really met somebody that you liked who happened to also enjoy meat occasionally um, in kind of a normal amount. But, like, I think it would kind of gross you out after a while. Or if they wanted to cook in the house or, you know oh, what I nice. mean? Like, see? <laughs> yeah, no. The, the thing is, I've I've been I've been single for so I only went officially vegan like three and a half years ago and I've been vegetarian for most of my life before that and I've always been in a household of vegetarian of vegetarians and then when I did live with my best friend she wasn't a mega meat eater and if she did eat any meat it would be kind of cured meat or it would be like in a pie or in a in like pasta or something like that so I wouldn't she'd never like cook a steak 
Mm-hmm. Actually being in a house where there has been meat cooked, it just smells so disgusting to me. So yeah, I mean, I haven't ever lived with a partner who has been, I've only ever lived with one partner and he didn't eat meat. So yeah, that hasn't ever been an issue for me. So it, yeah, it's obviously a hurdle that I am definitely going to have to cross one day on yeah. one that I haven't considered. But I would just hope that that person would be considerate enough of my belief system and my grossed outness that yeah. they would not do things that would grace me out. Like if they're going to eat meat at dinner, maybe bring your toothbrush and a flannel and just <laughs> say you won't touch me for a couple of hours. <laughs> so I sleep in the spare room. Yeah. You know, a tent in the garden. Like I don't want that. I don't want that. Memory. I don't know. This is a, a, a future me challenge, isn't it? <laughs> well, I think it's interesting because then you like, are you then going to have to change somebody like is that the goal you know or is it just sort of because I I have a friend who is a vegetarian except for when he hunts meat himself which is you know pretty rare so his whole family is vegetarian and he enjoys vegetarianism on a day-to-day basis but sometimes he'll have hunted something and he'll want to come home and cook it and he's all about cooking and he just really want, you know, and his, his family like can't be there, you know, but they've made it work, but the, it's definitely something that's like a contentious part of their like relationship where she's kind of judging him a little bit. And, you know, he feels constrained and can't like really be his full self. So I don't know. I think it's definitely something to consider though. I have a question that I'm curious about, because there's a lot of requirements for me and, and for all environmentalists in terms of who we date. Like whether it be like what they're eating, the work that they're doing, what they believe, where are we supposed to meet our perfect person? Because I find it hard to believe. Okay, where do we find, is it on the dating apps? Like where are we finding the people that we're talking about? Because I'd like to know. Anyone have any? I always thought that I would meet somebody at work. Like that was just what I thought. Like I thought like I'm going to go into my field and I'm going to meet somebody in my field who's similar to me and and has these sort of baseline similarities and I hasn't happened. um, So I don't know. And on the apps, it's really bad. So I don't have an answer for you. No, like the last guy that I dated was a climate scientist and he just ticked all these boxes like outdoorsy, climate scientist like oh man so handsome but a complete asshole Mm -hmm. (laughs) so it's like you tick all these boxes but just because you you tick all of these boxes of compact of like so-called compassion and things that you think are things that you really 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 value it can still bite you in the ass (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for me dating sites i haven't really really been on them for years i've kind of tried to use serendipity i guess and just natural situations uh, but it hasn't really worked for me either i mean i to be to be fair just to give you the full scope i've got a 10 year old daughter and i'm only 33 so you know she, she i was like 22 when she was born so i met her mom at like 21 and my life kind of turned upside down so for we broke up after like two years when my daughter was two and then for five years after that I was literally terrified of women. So I didn't, (laughs) I just didn't date women at all. I was just like, I was a chef. So for those five years, I was just basically living in a kitchen, uh, saving up for a mortgage and staying away from women basically until, (laughs) until I kind of, I I then got with um, a waitress that I were somewhere I was, where I was working kind of ground me down. And just because we didn't have loads in common, but it was just because I thought she was a nice person and we had like good banter. And although I knew there was kind of lots of lots of ways in which we weren't compatible, I thought that maybe the kind of just the vibe that we had between each other could kind of eradicate those things, but it didn't essentially in the end. So that was a bit of a lesson. Last person I was with was like, I mean, I'm doing like a a psychology degree to be um, a therapist, a psychotherapist, but I also just love nature, music, et cetera, et cetera. The last person I dated was doing a psychology PhD and she was great and she was into nature and there's, we had lots of things in common, but that was just kind of meeting through a friend that wasn't through a dating app or anything like that. So 
Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm actually considering going on dating apps in the future, maybe, because I don't feel like I've had time for that for a long period of time in my life. But I feel like I'm kind of my life cycle is opening up to that again a little bit. So, yeah, it might be something that I try. And I was thinking, yeah, would, would I put I'm a vegan? Would I put that I'm a vegan on my profile? Would I put this like, these kind of questions popping into my head as Hannah was talking about it? I was like, yeah, I don't know if I would because it's kind of that joke about vegans. Oh, how do you know someone's a vegan? Because they've already you. told you. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> it's kind of like I won't even. Go, I've had my share of heartbreaks, but I, I definitely relate to that heavily. Um, and something you said just about putting people off, like there's almost part of me as I date that is more ready to put people off. And in the past, I was like trying to meander this, like, I want everyone to like me. And as I've gotten older, I'm like, I'd almost rather be loved or hated than like, Mm -hmm. kind of like not showing my, my true personality. And I wish someone had been like earlier when I was dating, like, if they don't like you, it's like actually good because it means you're showing who you are and there's something to not like. Mm -hmm. And that, that's just something for me, like that I'm going to try to, and you guys hopefully will hold me accountable um, that like, I'd rather like, you know, say I'm, I don't eat meat and someone be like, Oh, it's, that's a deal breaker. Then I'll find, and then I'll move on and I don't waste my own time. Um, yeah, it's true. That just, you know what I mean? But that's a good point. I think it's, it's good to be picky, isn't it? The, you know, I, I find actually I'm really picky these days. I'm kind of maybe overly picky because I, I've spent too much time of my life with people that weren't compatible mm-hmm. with me. So I kind of, I'm like, no, yeah. And it's, it's kind of that is getting over that fear of being the fear of rejection or the fear of someone else not being interested in you because you're vegan or you're vegetarian or you're an environmentalist and being like, Oh, actually what's more important is someone being enthusiastic about the fact that I'm those things um, rather than someone that's scared by those things. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's having a positive mindset towards it, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, totally. And who you are. And it's something you can only really learn with age and experience. Like, I had so many people tell me, you know, in my early twenties, like that a lot of this stuff is insignificant, you know, just all the, all the things that I've come to realize through my own experience. I think it just has to do with confidence too, confidence in yourself, knowing that you are a catch, you know, and that somebody would be lucky to integrate their life with your life rather than you trying to prove to the other person that you're worthy of their time. And so that's been like a big learning curve for me. And it's just become a lot easier. Yeah. To just be like, all right, like that's not for me. You know, like I met a guy, I was at the bar waiting for my laundry to get done And uh, a guy started talking to me and uh, he was super nice. I thought he was cute, but then it it turns out that he had all these really weird beliefs. And I was just like, "Mm, I'm good. That's just, uh, this isn't going to go anywhere. And so I, you know, and I was just really, it was just really easy for me to just be like, no, and move on. And, you know, with rejections or ghosting or whatever it is, like you just kind of learn that that was, that person wasn't for you. And if it was a compatible or like a good match, like it would, it would be a lot more seamless the way that they, they would want to spend time with you and they would accept these things about you. Or like you said, Sean, be excited about these things about you, not just like, like, okay, you don't eat meat, but it'd be like, oh, you don't eat meat. That's really cool. Like maybe like we could talk about it or maybe I could like learn more about it. So I think there's just a lot that we learn with age, unfortunately. (laughs) So obviously, as I mentioned before, I've been traveling on my own for the past three years, like completely solo. And the initial travel was with my ex and we broke up after the first year of of traveling together. And I was really, really broken hearted and traveling on my own was something that I was always really, really, really terrified of. But the end of that relationship actually pushed me into doing that. And the past three years of my life have just been so, so, so amazing that I am so, I think I would be quite a difficult person to date because I have (laughs) such an intolerance for any kind of crap. Like the second anything's presented to me that I am not particularly, it's more of a behavior than like a, I eat meat kind of thing. But if there's a behavior that is exhibited. I just get really, I'm very, very quickly turned off by it. And I think the kids the longer, today call that the ick. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think I've got a quick ick. <laughs> Potentially what I would say is that I am actually really happy 
knowing that I know myself and I know what my expectations of another human being are because I'm so upfront and open because I've realized in the past few years that that's who I am and I'll always be upfront and open with a person so when that isn't reciprocated then ick mm-hmm. absolutely yeah, cuz i mean the the alternative is that you're still by yourself and if if you're if you spent years by yourself and you're happy in yourself then it's really not a bad thing i mean that a lot is of the, absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah like the most stable and balanced and happy i've been is probably been the years when i'm i'm by myself and sometimes relationships can be really unbalancing and kind of kind of mess your head up a little as well as your sort of life up a little bit you know in terms of your responsibilities and your focus so i think finding someone out and only accepting somebody that actually helps you to focus helps you to to be a better version of yourself is the person that you want to be with so any, anybody that does the opposite of any of those things isn't worth your time so mm-hmm. having that self respect to only accept the best for yourself through another person i think is the most important thing mm-hmm. mentality wise and not to lose yourself too you know what i mean because a lot of times we put so much into a relationship and then it ends i had one that i just was giving 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 and I like basically felt like I had nothing else besides that person I liked and it was keeping me going that ended. And I felt like my world ended. And so there's something to like staying true to yourself. Like the relationship is supplemental to who you are. And like, if you're on your mission, even if something gets derailed, you're still on your mission and you could keep going. And I feel like a lot of people unfortunately lose themselves in relationships. So it's important to try not to. I have a uh, question comment after Hannah, you were talking about traveling and everything. One of my fears that I have is like falling in love with someone. And I also know that I want to travel and like for extended periods of time. And I know a lot of environmental people relate to this. Like I'm working on a project in the Philippines. Like maybe I go there for six months. Like I, at at the spur of the moment, I want to feel that freedom to be able to travel and go do my work. And I'm scared to like really find that love, I think, because then what do I do? Is that something that everyone relates to? Or I know Hannah, how do you negotiate that when you're like, oh, he's going to travel? Does that person have to come with you or how does that work? To be totally honest, because of the last few years of being on my own, I've realized how much I need time on my own. And having returned to Europe recently and being around people a lot of the time makes me realize that I need that time to myself. So whoever I'm with is going to have to understand that I can't be with them all the time. Like I'm going to need space. And whether that's a few hours, a few days, a week, whatever it is, I think having that understanding with that person, I've got a lot of requirements, (laughs) whoever this person is, I feel terrible for them already, but I would love them to be able to understand that and even need that themselves. And I think my travel is a lot about being on my own and about exploring places and having quiet and peace and retreat from society. Because when I travel, I don't go to like, well, I sometimes would go to Paris, for example, but a trip to Paris would be a time where I would like somebody with me. But a trip to, I've just returned from New Zealand, but going on hikes on my own in New Zealand has been monumental to who I am as a person right now. And because I did that on my own, I needed to do that. I think I would like to meet somebody who was potentially in a flexible career, like a freelancer. I always say like a freelance graphic designer would be the man of my dream. Like that would be my, yeah, that would, yeah. (laughs) Because they don't need the internet all the time. Like I don't always have the internet. Like they do need it sometimes. Like they sometimes need to be still. They sometimes travel to like be inspired, which is exactly what I do. So having that love of travel would be amazing. Like if I, I, if I met someone and they said, okay, I live in London and I have to stay here for work and I'm, I don't want you to go off all the time. That would be a deal breaker for me. They would need to at least have a little bit of love, uh, love for travel or love for their independence. Mm -hmm. And I think, I guess, Sandra, to your question, I would like more men to recognize that independent women exist and me and Hannah love our independence and we gain so much from our independence and that we aren't looking necessarily for somebody to 
like really settle down with, you know, like sort of the traditional sense. Like, I guess I I've come across a lot of people in my, and <laughs> in, in my dating that make a lot of assumptions about women and make a lot of assumptions about what women want and what women don't want. And yeah, no, like, I think we're just both really good examples of, you know, like strong, independent women that are comfortable being alone, sometimes prefer being alone. And I think so often that that's put as sort of a masculine characteristic. And so I think that's also been an, uh, like an issue with me, like Sean was saying, like I am, I would much rather be alone and at peace and comfort in my own peace and aloneness than like trying to integrate my life with somebody that is, is disrupting that peace or, or is taking too much of my energy or my time or my, you know what I mean? So I think, I, I just think that's something like society needs to recognize, especially like the modern woman and what that looks like is that there's just a lot, there's a lot of differences these days. And like, I don't think every woman is looking for the same thing anymore. So there's just a, is a, a much broader spectrum and a lot a lot more that's um, allowed and and seen as societally acceptable. And I know that we kind of do fall out of that standard with the work that we do and the, that kind of thing. But I think there hopefully will be people that will recognize that that's important to us and, you know, vice versa. So I know this is a podcast, but I'll, I'll clap. <laughs> very good point. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, really refreshing to hear that as well, because I think as well, in terms of the sort of the traditional what's expected from a traditional relationship i've always found it can be a little bit claustrophobic and it can maybe it can get a little bit stagnant and even though i'm in a position where you know i've got a child i can't as much as i'd love to go traveling all the time i can't if i was with somebody that was in a much more flexible lifestyle then i wouldn't see that as a problem i'd be like oh that's amazing like you go and do you Mm -hmm. like i'll see you when i can see you and maybe we'll go here or we'll go there when when i can if that was like cool with them or if they wanted to be with someone that was like totally free as well then like i'd totally get that but it, from my perspective of where i am if if someone wanted to have like a more flexible relationship i think that's i think essentially if you if you find someone that you really 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 like and you envisage maybe like them being like the one or the life partner you've been looking for then it shouldn't matter if you want to go away for six months or if your job takes you away for filming in the amazon rainforest for a year because it's like okay well we'll kind of talk when we can and i'll see you next year and we'll continue our journey with each other then in whichever way that goes like there's no rush mm -hmm. if if you're going to spend a lifetime together you know yeah. But I've had guys just assume like that, that isn't something that I would want. And so they mm -hmm. like take it off the table completely. And so sort of, yeah, just sort of those stereotypes of like women want stability and they, you know, they want like in-person connection and like all these things, it's like not necessarily the case for every woman. And so I just want more people to recognize that, that some women are looking for exactly what you're looking for, or maybe even a more extreme version of what you're looking for. Or, I don't know. There's just a lot of opportunities to learn and I don't know, change, change your mind about something. Yeah. I'm really glad you brought it up because I feel, I feel like, like hopeful even more so that I could find someone that wants to live the way that I want to. And like, I, I always look at my friends and I compare, we always compare ourselves to the people around us. I have friends that they're like, they're dating at the same amount of time that I've been dating the person I'm currently seeing. And like, he's, my friend is seeing this girl three, four, five times a week. And I only see the person I'm seeing once a week. And, and a lot of it is because like, I need to hike after work or I need to hike on the weekends because for my mental health. And part of me feels like it, it's not as strong as my friend's relationship because I'm not seeing that person. So it's like kind of mm -hmm. like what you're talking about, redefining what a modern relationship could look like. And I feel like society has told us what one looks like. And so that's yeah. why I'm glad, Serena, that you reminded us that like yeah. what you identify as an independent woman today is so different and like, there are people just like you out there that you can find. Yeah. Giving so we space should be to picky. them too. Yeah. Like you should be picky, but like allowing, allowing for space without like in your example, Xander, like not just sort of being like, oh, well, this is our schedule right now. And I'm comparing myself to my other friends. So clearly this isn't going to work. Like, even if I like this person a lot, like she might be going, well, I, you know, 
I I'm spending just the right amount of time with, with Sander. And like, this is actually working really great, but like, you won't know that unless you communicate with the other person. So I would just like veer very much away from making assumptions and just really communicate, ask the person, is this working for you or not? And they can tell you themselves if it is. Absolutely. I think making assumptions is such a dangerous game, especially in the day, like in, in any, in any world, but especially in the dating world, like the last guy that I dated, one of his first questions to me was, you've got such an awesome digital nomad, like traveling around the world lifestyle. Why would you want to give that up for a boyfriend? And I was like, I'm not giving you anything said anything up. about that. Yeah. <laughs> she was like, Hold on. Just, just before you get ahead of yourself, nothing's being given up here. Like if anyone's invited into my life, they enhance it. They don't take away. <laughs> so just to lay that law down for starters. Yeah. But yeah. Maybe I scared him from the start. I don't know. <laughs> Which is good, right? Which we already established is like probably for the best. (laughs) Hannah, he'd have to give up his lifestyle for your lifestyle. Opposite. (laughs) I mean, I'd meet him in the middle somewhere, but maybe more towards my end. (laughs) This is not a really interesting point because it's kind of that kind of leads to like the I think the sense of possession that often goes Mm. with like a relationship. And like, oh, you're gonna have to give that up because you're mine now, like almost Mm -hmm. like you belong to me. It's that's such a I don't know a weird old fashioned concept of like love like love is meant to be setting somebody free isn't it yeah. and like if you love someone you let them do what they want to do and that the and woman has them. to calibrate her life around a man you know if we're talking about a, a, a cis mm-hmm. relationship like that's a, a huge assumption and that guy made that huge huge assumption like how are you going to adjust your life so that you can like orbit around me you know. <laughs> That in of itself yeah. just speaks volumes to me about that person. There's also something like growing up. I also have a very strong Jewish mother who is like that. Her only wish for me is that I marry a Jewish woman. Good, good luck. Cause I'm already, I already have a lot of specifics that I have to have to be met, <laughs> but from a young age. And I, I'm, I'm sure you guys feel like it, it. Like when you said that Sean, that a relationship will set you free. i grew up with this idea of like finding someone who's like one of the most important things and it was like constantly like looking, looking, looking. And that was almost more of a focus of finding someone than like finding myself. And I feel like as I've gotten older, that has to be more important because once you find yourself, then you could find people like we'll mm-hmm. find people that fit in with their independent lifestyle. But there's such a weird societal like you're not someone until you find someone else is such a weird concept that I feel like has been propagated for so long. And I think it's slowly changing. But these conversations are really important to see that. Mm-hmm. it's not yeah. always like yeah that. so true so true uh, you you really you really do i think it's it's such a sad thing that you i know a lot of people that do it they jump from one relationship to the next one to the next mm-hmm. one to the next one because they're kind of terrified of spending any time by themselves as most people in society are terrified of spending any time alone or alone especially without any distractions whether it be social media or or just something to do, you know, and being able to just sit there and breathe and just be there is, is such a um, a primal thing that we've kind of lost as we've almost over evolved as a society, really. So I think it kind of, yeah, such a such a layered problem, but it's such an important one, yeah, for us to find ourselves really before we find somebody else. There's kind of a, a, probably a deep primal yearning within us that we kind of need to find a mate when we haven't got one at some level. But if you can kind of like override that by the logic of oh, actually it's not the right time for me for whatever reason, or you just need to, yeah, just to find that comfort within yourself and really explore who you are to then ex- to really find out who you, who you would like to share your life with. And that takes and time. Person, it does yeah, a lot of that, time. That takes a lot of time and a lot of self-work. That is something that I'm really trying to work on is like, okay, if I don't find, you know, I think and we're all kind of the same age, calibrating what I deem as like a successful life. And like, if I don't meet somebody ever, that that's okay. And if I meet somebody in my late thirties, that's okay. Like I, I just really, just really having to like, remember that because dating can be so shitty and just take so much out of you. It can really hit your confidence. And just, I think having that to really fall back on is like, this is about you. This is about your journey and you improving yourself finding out about yourself so that somebody would be lucky enough to like join your orbit, you know, versus the other way around. And I think it just really comes back to that. Like you said, Sean. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it's a good point you make as well about like not feeling like you have to rush because I guess as we're getting older, we have these kind of, oh, you know, I'm 30 odd now. I need to kind of find the one or 
whatever it might be in your, in your mind. Because if we're rushing, then we often make the mistakes and we often waste in years of our life of somebody that we shouldn't have accepted as a partner because we knew deep down they weren't right for us all along. So I guess being patient and picky and waiting for the right person, even if it's going to be five years later and you're kind of worrying every year, I'm getting older, or I need to settle down and have kids, or I need to do this, I need to get a house, whatever it might be that you kind of deep anxieties are on the back of your mind, that actually it's more important to, to just wait for the right thing rather than the thing that you think needs to happen now. Yeah. And I think it's still okay to make mistakes, right? Like I don't think having a failed relationship is a mistake necessarily like you learn so much from that about yourself what you want and what you don't want from somebody mm -hmm. and i've been trying to look at life more in chapters than you know as this one big really hard thing to just imagine but if i chunk it out in chapters like okay you know the next 5 years will be a chapter in my life as i'm like make this big career shift or you know my 20s were a chapter where i was like really in my head about something and so like relationships don't have to like successful relationships don't have to mean marriage, kids, house, like successful relationships can mean a long-term partnership that you both grew from and you both left each other better than you found them. And maybe it lasted two years, but that's a successful relationship. And that's a good chapter of your life that you can learn from. It doesn't have to be seen as like a failure because you've now lost two years and you're in your mid third, you know what I mean? Like, I think we just really, mm. as folks our age, really have to redefine what success means for us. And that's a great point eh? that, that, you know, yeah, but I think we do, but we're always, I the default mindset is that every relationship previous is a failure, right? Because we're not in it. But yeah, it's such a refreshing thought really to think, well, no, actually I learned loads from that one and that one and that person. And yeah, so they're all successful in their own ways, even if they didn't end in the best way or, if it didn't feel like a success at the end of it, yeah, there's always something to reflect on and learn from it. I'm just thinking back to when I was dating and just for complete transparency, I would go on a lot of dates and I'd date someone for maybe two, three months and it would, they would just simmer out. It was, it was happening multiple times and I really couldn't figure it out. Why, like couldn't figure out why. And then as I've gone older, I realized I didn't really know who I was. And I was like putting out a version of myself to try to adhere to what I thought that other person wanted me to be. And I wasn't ready, you know? So there's like, it's not only like, a, we look at relationships that didn't happen as a failure, but you weren't ready and little by little you you make progress and, and maybe one day you'll be ready. But I think it's important to have a lot of male friends that talk about like what they think women want when they get older, like they wanna have kids and they're gonna wanna settle down. And uh, my friends probably won't listen to this cause they're not the ones I'm talking about are really environmentalists. But I, I just think it's important to like kind of, and, and we already had this conversation, but expand your mind beyond like this stereotype of women as they get older, just wanting to have kids and wanting to settle down. Cause I have a lot of friends that think that, and they, it's a little bit of a side tension, but I just think that was an yeah. important in context of what we were talking about before. And we didn't really talk about kids. The one thing that I'm kind of <laughs> learning in my experiences is like guys who I've come across that are environmentalists, like self-identified or like no way kids like they're so bad for the environment and like <laughs> on one level i i'm like yeah no that's that's super true but on another hand i'm like well but like maybe i do want kids i don't know but like i don't know kids are kind of a an environmental topic too for folks like us because i think it is becoming more stigmatized actually to want kids these days and like see that as something positive on one hand, you have the opportunity to kind of like shape this little human into somebody that cares about the environment for future yeah. generations and sort of bring them up, bring them up in sort of like a super wholesome way that, you know, this, this army of the next generation of people that can look after the world. But yeah, I mean, it's in the other sense, you know, having, having a child does take away your freedom for like 20 years. So it's, it's a massive thing. So it's kind of, I don't know, from someone that had a daughter so young, you know, my kind of plan for my life is that I would be 30 odd, you know, and I'd have traveled and I've done all, all these things before I had kids. So if you're going to have kids, you need to get that out of your system to a point where you truly feel like, okay, I'm ready for this next venture stage of my life where I'm going to like bring these people into the world and you know, we can travel as a family, we can do this, we can do that. But I understand that I'm, I might be free again in 20 years to kind of like have the my retirement or whatever it might be. Say if you're, if you're 35, 
you know, at 55, I'll be kind of free again to an extent. But you need to have that like solid thing of, right, I'm, I'm ready for this. Or you're just going to resent them and you're going to resent the situation that you're in, which isn't good for anyone. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it's it's a huge, it's a huge undertaking. Yeah, you just, you just got to be ready for it, especially if you're traveling to beautiful places and your job includes travel. I think if, if you, it's something where you could bring up a family with that lifestyle, if there's two of you that have a similar job and, or I don't know, maybe there needs to be one of you that's more grounded. So there's like a school for the kid and then the other ones off traveling and maybe you take it in turns. I don't know. De-schooling is like a massive thing in Australia and you get these families who've got like a big bus and they travel around and like the world is the kid's school and then they kind of facilitate lessons and stuff and then because on any campground there's four buses all the kids play together and I was just watching them thinking yeah that's how I would want to raise a kid because Mm -hmm. there's parts of being in a relationship to me right now that seem really terrifying because I don't want to give up my lifestyle I don't want to have to stay in a place unless I love the place and then yeah potentially I would consider living a slightly less nomadic lifestyle but having a kid does cut that does can well it can completely cut that off but for me it would be something that I would could want to continue the life that I lead only doing it in a slightly different way where the child would have a base which would probably be some kind of bus <laughs> and then in my spare time I could teach I could teach the child for a certain amount of years and see how it's going and etc cetera, etc cetera. And it just looked like a really beautiful way to raise a family and for me I always think this part of me that thinks, oh, I like really, I don't want to have kids because of environment, blah, blah, blah. Um, and obviously as a Western person, they would live a relatively high carbon lifestyle. They would have a certain burden on the environment. Mm-hmm. But isn't it better that I have a child that I could shape and mold and make them into like a decent human being? But then again, you don't know what you're going to get. You could get right. a, a child who wants to be an oil baron and go... <laughs> I don't know, like go or like. I just, I'm just picturing this little like abattoir owner. (laughs) Like I love oil. I love big oil. But there's also like we did a we did a podcast interview. The last episode was about like raising children in a dying world too. It's like, what do you tell your kids when you're like as 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 environmentalists now? We understand the the shit that we're in right now, and like thinking about another human's life for the next. 80 years on this planet, it's like, I wouldn't want to be here, but it's also true. Like you want to raise the next generation of people that can maybe like make this place better and, and, and get us out of the mess we're in. And like, I, I go back and forth with this all the time. Well, I would love to see Hannah, you living like the Thornberries. I don't know if anyone's seen <laughs> <laughs> Angel, that, Nigel Thornberry. That was my inspiration for my, there, for my life's work. <laughs> there you go. Me too. So you, Having a little, I imagine a little Hannah uh, yeah. running around would be fun. And also little kids that ski. I just went skiing this weekend or last weekend. And like, they're like five and they're like little people and they're skiing. It's so cute. So you can make your lifestyle, but I, not to get too serious, but I do want to make the point that one of the eco-fascism kind of ideologies is that overpopulation is like the major cause of climate change. And it's like puts an unprecedented amount of blame on developing countries that have population increasing higher than we do that how we think of over, overpopulation also has shifted in terms of the the significance i just want to put that out there not to be too serious but all your points were, were good that's what i mean about my child having a heavier carbon burden and and being more of a burden to the environment than a child who was raised in a different part of the world but i mean as totally. a parent you can try and make them have uh, like less of an impact but yeah it's still it's still difficult when you live in a city with urban sprawl or they need clothes or anything along those lines it's a it's yeah it's a it's a minefield another minefield what's your ideal date as an environmentalist Ooh. first date i'm gonna say <laughs> first date i'm gonna make it more specific first date oh Andrew, i, have, have, to go I first. have to go first Just, yeah it was yeah. a good question <laughs> Set okay, the well, set the standard. I would love to, uh, first date. Okay, I'm gonna say I'm gonna talk about first couple dates. I would love. I do love like a hike, like a picnic, something outdoorsy, and seeing how a potential partner like reacts. The more mileage we can do to see if they're really a trooper, <laughs> the, the better. There is one person that I know, a friend of mine, that 
once told me that he likes to set up a hammock. He pulls it out of his backpack and like they don't know that, that he has and he pulls it out. And it's like kind of cute. And it'll be like he'll take them to a nice area outside. I find that pretty good. I've never done the hammock, but I admire it. That's um, a move. That is a move. I like that it a lot. But, but a first date, like you don't want to hike on a first date because that's no, a huge I was investment. Say, huge well, also, investment. Safety wise for women, it's like, I don't know you yet. We're going to go to hike to this remote area alone. <laughs> Would you like okay, to come with the, a stranger the into this state. place you've never been? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where we're out of cell signal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Fourth or fifth date hike. (laughs) Coffee first date is what is my answer. Who's going next? I was going to say, I actually went on my ideal first date with this, with the the last guy that I dated and it was a hike, but I, I planned it. I kind of, I knew where we were going and it was a snowstorm and it was up this beautiful Austrian mountain and there were all these little churches along the way that you could like stop in and we had like I had a a flask with me and some snacks and it was it was just absolutely beautiful and I think for me being in a surrounding that triggers conversation is really important because I got into this cycle of date when I was going on dates of telling the same stories over and over again and then if it got to the second date I'd be like oh, did I already tell you that story? Or was it that other guy that I went on a date on? (laughs) (laughs) And then date with like the other week, like I can't can't remember. Like, and then I was like, you really, really need to stop doing this because you're not getting to know the person. They're not really getting to know you. You're just a storybook. (laughs) Basically, it's the same thing. Yeah, like again and again and again. But I like being in those kinds of surroundings because firstly, you can see if they're into nature and appreciate it and secondly there it triggers lots of different conversations that you can have and we were both falling over in the snow and you'd put your foot down and your foot would sink and it was just funny it was like a really funny silly lovely freezing cold (laughs) but amazing date so I think doing something like that just in nature even if it's not going for a hike if it's just something like sitting in a park or Mm. yeah was that date number one or five? What what number was that? That was our first date. It was just perfect. And I think that was why I was quite taken with him from, from the start, but didn't work Sounds out. Like oh man, it sounded like the start of the rom-com that I've been looking for in my entire life right there. <laughs> exactly, you it was. That, there were so it. many meat cutes. It was just full, full of meat cutes every, every two seconds. For me personally, a hike for the first date is like a little too intense for me. Like... I don't know if I want to be stuck spending a couple hours with this person that I don't know. And if I, re- you know, and if I find that I don't have a lot to talk about or like their personality, or like, and I'm stuck with you on, um, you know what I mean? So I think <laughs> that's definitely a great sort of like second, third, et cetera for me. But I think first date for me, I love a dive bar and drinks. It's not a commitment to like dinner. And you don't even have to sit across from each other. Like you could sit at the bar or like in the corner and people watch as you kind of like get to know each other. Um, Maybe there's like weird music on that you can talk about. And then, you know, just kind of like walking around. I love sort of like walk from place to place dates, like where you have opportunities to really talk. I hate a formal dinner. I can't stand a formal dinner where I'm like, dude, what should I order? Like, can I order what I really want to order? Like, do I, I, you have to stare at me like eating. I hate people watching me eat. Like, yeah. So I think, I think the more casual for me, a coffee date gives off sort of like a certain vibe to me. Like I have places to be or, you know, people to see. And so we need to wrap this up and make it quick. Or I don't know. I, I, I definitely like a drink sort of at a bar type of date first there's a first lack of commitment that. with a coffee date, yeah yes exactly <laughs> exactly okay guys tearing apart my coffee date. i'm taking notes here <laughs> i wish that people could see i'm taking notes here yeah no <laughs> no yeah coffee date no hike on the first date no except for if you're hannah then it's then it's like golden i'm well, just inviting kind of- you along to my day basically <laughs> like, yeah. no, i'm not changing yeah. my day you just you yeah. just come with me <laughs> <laughs> That would be my thing as well, to be honest with you. I mean, it's I, I get the whole thing of like going to danger and everything. But 
yeah, I would want to just go for a walk, whether it, it didn't, it didn't have to be like a long hike in the wilderness, but just somewhere where you can walk and talk, you can stop, have a little chat. I think sometimes when you just met somebody, like sitting, like you were saying, sitting opposite them can be a little bit in, like intimidating or a bit much. Yeah, where you can you kind of side by side, you talk, you kind of look at each other sometimes, you giggle, you have a laugh, whatever. Then you can sit, you can have a bit more of a deeper talk or whatever. And, you know, it's not so far that I guess, yeah, you can sort of press the reject button and eject yourself yeah. out of there. Yeah. And uh, okay, well, let's go back to the car or let's go, <laughs> let's go back to the bus, whatever, you know what I mean? So I think that's probably quite a nice compromise in terms of the two, in terms of like a, I don't know, to a nice country park or a nice place just outside the city where there's lots of other people mm-hmm. to an extent, but you still have enough of nature to kind of talk about it and, and just get to know each other. And then it can be like, oh, do you want to go for like a longer hike in, da, 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 mm-hmm. I guess would be like a nice kind of introduction to it but really i'd like to go like swimming in the river and right uh, like there's a lot of things really would, yeah, yeah for sure you know, maybe for later yeah have yeah. any of you guys seen the movie on hulu called fresh oh no. okay it just it just dropped like last week um i'd recommend all of you guys watch it and, and our listeners too if you're a single person who's dating right now because i saw like a little clip of it and i thought it was just going to be like kind of a modern romantic comedy and it looked really good i was like oh that's super relatable um and then as you like the first 30 minutes are basically women who date men it's like i were dream scenario of what it like to get to know a guy and like have them be interested in you and sort of what that feels like and how how great it can feel and then and then 30 minutes and your jaw is just on the floor and it's like this whole different movie and it's amazing and terrifying and but like it's i just there's there's so much commentary in that film about what dating is like these days and yeah no i think i think it's important for men who date women to just be cognizant of like that reality for us in a safety perspective like what, what you would want to do and like the freedom that you guys have, but is not necessarily the same freedom that like women enjoy because of society and how shitty it can be and how scary it can be. A person, the person that I'm dating had a scary experience when she was hiking alone with a male encounter. And it definitely made me appreciate my, like, or the- Maleness. The male, the male, male privilege. privilege, the privilege. That's yeah, yeah. the maleness, the male privilege mm-hmm. of me enjoying the, the outdoors versus a female enjoying the outdoors. Yeah. And yeah. then, so when we talk about dating, going on a hike, you know, for a male, it seems fine, but for a female, it doesn't. There's a lot of crossover for sure. Mm-hmm. And like, like Hannah and I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago about solo hiking as a woman outdoors, you know, and like, I don't want to go into a tangent, but you know, there's just a lot of things that I think men don't think of because they don't have that reality that they live in. So I don't know. There's just like, we're, we live like different realities a lot of times, even though there is a lot of crossover. I don't know, but yeah, the environmentalist thread, I think is a really interesting thread to look at that brings us together you know, in this world. Yes, it's a really interesting point you make about the way that you that you look at a relationship or you look at dating as a man or as a woman. I'm always, because of, I guess I know how bad society is, I, I try and be as conscious of that as possible when dating a woman and just kind of get inside her mind to think of how she might feel about me or how you're acting or like, I find it sometimes quite difficult to make the first move as a man in today's mm. society, more, mm. maybe more than than ever, because if you make that move, you can kind of come off as too forward or as, as like a creep or whatever. And it's like, you can't, but then kind of, I feel like there's still a stigma and an old fashioned stereotype that the, the man should make the first move. So it's kind of a bit of a weird headspace to be in because you kind of like, yeah, it's difficult to know what to do unless you're hoping it's just going to happen naturally and it's going to be like that magic moment where you both reach in for the kiss at the same time and it just stars are in the sky, you know what I mean? But it often doesn't happen like that. So it's quite an interesting headspace to be in, quite an awkward headspace to be in. Mm-hmm. Um, that yeah. reminds me, speaking of male versus female when, when it comes to dating on dating apps, it was something I wasn't aware of, like getting someone's phone number, getting a girl's phone number, getting their, their Instagram, Instagram profile. And I've had where I asked and they were like, Oh, I don't really know you yet. I don't want to share that. And so I called my friend. I was like, Oh, is this something like I, 
is did I do something wrong? And she was like, oh, actually, I don't even give out. I'll never give out my Instagram until I meet the person or even phone number. And so for me at that moment, I was, it was something I took for granted that I just like, I don't have to worry about generalized, but I don't have to worry about a, the girl stalking me or finding me or like, you know, messaging me on Instagram in the same way that we expect like a male could. And it was something that I was like, oh, this is like a problem that I wasn't thinking of. And so now I'm a little bit more like cognizant of that. So if I'm asking a girl for an Instagram, I'll be like, if in parentheses, like if you want to, if you mm-hmm. feel comfortable, like you don't have to, we could continue talking. That's just something I, that Sean, when you're talking, it made me think of. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because the last thing you want to do is make them uncomfortable. And it's, and that's kind of like a massive thing that's on your mind just like as a person. And then it gets to the point where maybe like you do want to make a move, but you're not sure if they're going to reciprocate that. And then it's that kind of real awkward bridge between how are we going to find out? Then because kind of you take, you have that conversation before uh, making a move, it kind of takes the, the sort of nuance away from it and the excitement away from it. So it kind of, it's quite, it's quite a difficult yeah. uh, position to be in. Yeah, it's um, like the, the guy is trying to make the woman feel as comfortable as possible. And the woman is just trying not to get murdered. Like we're just trying to like, <laughs> you <yeah>. know, <laughs> we're trying to like go against our instincts and force ourselves to be like, convince ourselves that this guy is not going to hurt us <laughs> or kill us or you know what I mean and like yeah. you got your your sort of like reassurance it means a lot to us actually especially in the first you know meeting the first few meetings like that and that's so interesting because we're coming from two different perspectives on that is like we are we're coming at it like cautiously and I think well I think both are coming at it cautiously but for two different reasons I guess yeah it's interesting and I wonder what actually makes women feel more comfortable is it a guy that's actually quite can be quite like maybe direct and forward and his kind of intentions are kind of laid bare from the start or is it a guy that's kind of trying to <laughs> you're trying his hardest to make you feel comfortable that but that's kind of making you feel uncomfortable because you're not sure what his intentions <laughs> are or you're like do you know what I mean it's kind of yeah. a weird tightrope and I don't know what the answer is either I think it's probably a bit of both like mm. I appreciate directness but I also would want someone to really try to make me feel comfortable and like break down those barriers and and not just go at it like all right I'm this and this are you in or you know what I mean like mm-hmm. transactional mm-hmm. sort of thing so I don't know I, I... <laughs> not very very romantic <laughs> yeah it's my business card yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> We can vet here's my LinkedIn. On LinkedIn. Yeah, here's my LinkedIn. <laughs> you, you, you. I was laughing when you were when you were saying what you're like it, being too direct or not direct because all the time I like will call my my buddy and be like, I'm, did I fuck that up? And then he's like, he'll be like, oh, like let me tell you about what I'm doing. And like we're just like bumbling idiots, like trying to figure out how to date. Like and and Hannah, you had mentioned assumptions, like how bad assumptions are. Like me and my friends will be like, oh my God, she used two exclamation marks, blah, 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 blah. Like, it's just like, it's almost like we're all, I, f- I find a solidarity and like trying to, trying to get through dating as a, as a team sort of, and realizing like, you're never going to do anything perfectly, but I feel like it's important to be like, all right, I did, I used to do that. Like, let me change that and try to not do things. Wish I had an answer for the direct versus non-direct Sean, but I'm going to have to call you next time I have an issue and be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> What's hey, up here? Great. <laughs> I think it is comforting to know that like you guys, like guys like talk to each other, like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> did I say the wrong thing? You know what I mean? I love that. Like that a thousand percent. Any, yeah. any man who pretends like that's not true is such a fucking liar. Like we're literally <laughs> like every text girls that you, you send us is going through at least three men. Well, then that, what's no the idea. problem? Like, why are we still in this mode where men, like, if you guys are like, that's, that's what kind of scares me a little bit is if you guys are having like guys behind the scenes vetting what you're saying, or like, you know, like helping you with a scenario. And then we're still coming to these really shitty, like decisions. (laughs) I'm like, why can't like the collective brain is not like, I don't know. You know what I mean? Am I, kind just, of am I just bitter? I'm just, just bitter. You're bitter, but yeah. also we're kind of dumb. We're also probably asking people that are holding fish in their profile. Pictures. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> kissing, <laughs> kissing fish. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you have to kiss them. <laughs> but I, I mean, I think that we could, we could talk for hours, right? Like, I mm. think there's just so much. And 
I think it would be really cool to maybe come back to this conversation and um, maybe just do like updates on our lives and like what we've learned and what's changed and, you know, like a few weeks or months or something like that and see where we're at, you know, down the road. So sure. I would love it. That would be really cool. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to end the conversation on just saying that you have to kiss a lot of fish until you find your kids charming. <laughs> <laughs> Forget yourself, your very name For your health, relieve the pain Ego when your name, driving you insane Only got yourself to blame, got yourself to blame So relax, let yourself collapse Memory lapse, slip into the portal Thank you so much for listening. If today's episode raised any questions for you that you'd like to ask any of our guests, or if you have any comments about what you've heard, or about your own romantic life, please get in touch on our Facebook or Instagram at Earth to Humans Pod. This podcast was produced by me, Hannah Mulvaney, and our head producer, Serena Simons. The outro music was created by Aquatic Ape, aka Sean, on today's podcast. Of imperfections. Forget your birthday, your worst day, your best day. You're no one in the best way. So open up a good book Lose yourself in the world that they construct Feel faded as you turn the pages Self-consciousness erase it Ebook, swipe and deface it It's nice and it's basic Take time and embrace it Forget yourself, your very name For your health, relieve the pain Ego in your name, driving you insane only got yourself to blame, got yourself to blame Looking through my eye, who am I? Looking through the druid's eye, through the sky Forget who you are for a minute, take your heart for a visit Close your eyes, feel calm and envisage Ascension to a dimension The void of identity retention Lose consciousness of your self-consciousness Let it vanish, one less thing to manage Take a breath and forget Oxygen check, feel blessed, less distress and regret Cross the bridge between your body and your mind Let it be one, peace you will find Forget yourself, your very name For your health, relieve the pain Ego when your name driving you insane Only got yourself to blame Got yourself